Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations. Joining us again is Peter Gelb, general manager of the Metropolitan Opera. Recently, Peter produced a fascinating documentary entitled The Opera House, coming soon to your local public television station. The Opera House, the film, is about a 50-year saga where the Metropolitan Opera transitioned from a legendary, although technically deficient, old building at Broadway and 39th Street, where Toscanini conducted and Caruso, Sutherland, and Kalos magically performed to the state-of-the-art opera house at Lincoln Center we know today. The Old Met, demolished in 1967, gave its last performance in April 1966. The present opera house opened in September 1966 with Leontine Price in the title role of Samuel Barber's opera, Antony and Cleopatra. And as Peter's movie relates, the transition was anything but seamless. Peter, we're pleased to welcome you back to the program. Thanks, Jim. Now, Peter, uh, how did you get interested uh, in a review of uh, the history of the new Met and the, the demolition of the old Met? Well, I guess I became interested uh, in, in it because of the anniversary. Of last, last year was the 50th anniversary of the new Met. And we uh, embarked upon a series of uh, celebrations and explorations, and you know, uh, drawing on my on my background as a documentary filmmaker, I uh, called my old documentary filmmaking partner Susan Frumke, uh, with whom uh, I've produced and, and co-directed many films, uh, ranging from films about the life and art of Vladimir Horowitz to Herbert von Karajan to. Uh, Rostropovich going back to Russia. We worked on many films together. And, I, and she's made, actually, Susan has made uh, several films um, about the Met already. She made uh, the film Wagner's uh, Dream about the, uh, the mounting of uh, the Robert Lepage ring cycle. Um, she also made a wonderful film uh, called The Audition, which is a, a, about the, uh, the thousands of opera hopefuls who compete across the country and, and uh, hoping to win a place on the stage of the Met and, and launch their careers. So uh, it seemed like the right moment to go back and, in time and look at the rich history of the Met. Um, and it was uh, remarkable. I mean, Susan, of course, as the director, did, did most of the work. Uh, but I uh, was with her in the um, editing room and uh, um, and helping along the way, including getting Leontine Price, uh, perhaps the most celebrated singer um, in during this transitional time and one of the greatest singers in the history of, of, uh, of America and the world, opera singers, uh, to give a rare interview um, uh, just shy of her 90th birthday. And Leontine, of course, is uh, as smart as a whip and, as, and terribly clever and funny and very emotional. She really kind of made the film, uh, gave it a great a human, human element that made the film come alive uh, so strongly for the audiences who have seen it. So was it more natural for you in light of your experience to uh, do a documentary movie about it rather than a book or, uh, uh, or an article? Well, well, I think, you know, the, the, the um, I, I'm all in favor of books and articles, and, that, and of course there have been articles written about the Mets history, many of them. What I thought was a great opportunity for uh, audiences was to see, never before has so much rich archival footage been brought together, um, and that's really the, the backbone of the film, um, to see, and that's something that can't be uh, enjoyed in an article or a book. I mean, the, 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 arch the archival footage included uh, uh, footage of BBC, uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, all you know, all the great newsreel footage and documentaries that were made at the time, including this uh, remarkable film called Countdown to Curtain, which was a Bell Telephone Hour special at the time uh, to coincide with the opening of the new Met, that inc that uh, really had a an excellent bird's eye view inside the Opera House as the last minute. Uh, uh, his histrionics of getting this opera house um, open uh, took place. I mean, there were uh, th there was a, 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 um, a possible strike of the musicians. The uh, fire department was threatening to close down the house even before it opened uh, for various you know uh, things that had to be had to be cleared up before before the opening night could take place. Uh, there were technical failures, uh, turntable disasters. Uh, uh, Zeffirelli having uh, you know Franco Zeffirelli, the great director who who 
directed the opening night production of the new Met, uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, which Leontine Price um, sang in. Uh, uh, his uh, dealing with the the, uh, the 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 new technical infrastructure of this built of this opera house, which at the time was considered to be one of the new wonders of the world in terms of theatrical ability, but it wasn't. All the bugs had not been uh, uh, it cleared up uh, prior to the opening, so there were lots of uh, of, of, of issues and and, uh, and and problems that had to be overcome. Well, we'll get to that. You, you took over as general manager in uh, 2006, so you've been at it a little more than a decade. Uh, did you ever hear an opera at the Old Met? No, I never, never did. did. But, but my, my uh, uh, youthful experiences included being at the New Met shortly after it opened. Uh, when I was uh, 13, I was invited uh, to join my parents. My father was then uh, uh, the cultural editor of the Times, or city editor. Um, and uh, he and my mom were invited to join Rudolf Bing, who was then the general manager and who plays a big role in this film, uh, to sit in his box and, there, and I was brought along. And I had this uh, wonderful experience of being in this opera house, sitting in Bing's box and watching not only the spectacle on stage, which was a new production of Carmen, uh, starring Grace Bumbry, one of the great singers of, of the time, but also watching Bing in action because he, in the middle of the performance, several uh, of the attendees uh, started booing uh, Bumbry for some reason, and Bing uh, became apoplectic with rage and leaped from his seat in his box and ran out and uh, confronted the booers and told them to shut up. And, have uh, you ever done anything like that since your general manager? No, <laughs> I have not. I've never confronted a booer, but I certainly have heard boos. Uh, but, uh, um, Did it enrage you when you heard the boos? No, usually it's it's uh, it's uh, it's not it's not certainly not uh, a happy moment to hear booze, but but I also understand that for some opera goers, it's kind of a rite of passage for them. Some some fanatics come, I think, prepared to boo, regardless of what they experience on the stage, simply because a production style they've read about is going to be different than than what they've been used to. Well, tell but, us a little more about Bing. He was a legendary figure in the history of the Metropolitan Opera, and it certainly was the guiding spirit in the move from the old opera house to the new. Well, he you know, was uh, a, mag a magnetic uh, personality. He, uh, um, as you said, I mean, he came to the Met, and this is in the film as well, in, in the, uh, around 1949, uh, determined to transform the Met into a real um, theatrical um, uh, experience for, for the audiences. He, he, wanted, he was not content to just have singers stand and sing. He wanted to bring in directors from Broadway, uh, Many of the things that I've tried to do in my mm -hmm. own in my own time, uh, to you know, to enrich and 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 make theatrical the opera experience and, and refresh it. So and and at the same time, he was also very aware of the limitations of the old opera house, which was built really primarily for the uh, for the audience's comfort uh, in terms of the boxes. You know, the history of the old Met uh, goes back to the late 1800s when um, uh, the nouveau riche of society in that time period um, were unhappy that they had been kind of shut out of the good seats in, in the other opera house that existed at the time. So they decided to form their own opera house. And they hired an architect to design it for maximum comfort for them in, in what is known as the, uh, the diamond circle that they diamond sat. Diamond horseshoe. The diamond horseshoe, rather, uh, where they sat in luxury. Uh, but unfortunately, there was very little attention paid to the demands of the stage. So there was no backstage space. Scenery had to be uh, stored out in the street on 7th Avenue. Uh, there were no... I real, remember the elephants in Aida had to be uh, sort of led across the stage and out into 7th Avenue and, and into uh, uh, trucks where they were transported, I don't know, back to the circus or wherever they came from. Well, I wasn't there, but, <laughs> but it was certainly a very cramped and unsatisfying uh, um, way of working if you wanted to present opera as theater. And of course, as we know, opera is, when it works, uh, the most magical of theatrical forms. You know, it's a, it's a musical theater experience that involves um, hundreds of performers, you know, a large orchestra, uh, you know, more, f more artistic forces than, than any other art form that's performed on a regular nightly basis. And so Bing knew that it wasn't good enough, the old opera house, and he was determined to find better quarters. And, and he was a pioneer in other respects because he introduced singers of, uh, of color to uh, the opera. Uh, Marian Anderson, Leontine Price, you mentioned Grace Bumbry. 
Shirley Verrett. Uh, this was uh, quite a breakthrough at the time, was it not? Right. I think well, his policy was to present the best singers regardless of uh, color or, or any other consideration. And, it's, and it's, it, that, then that casting policy continues today. I mean, my, my concern at the Met uh, to, is to get the very best singers in the world. Uh, and we have no quota systems. We don't favor American singers over European singers, or, or, or we just look for the best singers in the world, as, as Bing did back then. Now, who were the major players in the construction of the new opera house? Well, the major players were John D. Rockefeller, um, who led the fund. Uh, John D. Rockefeller III. John D. Rockefeller III, who led the fundraising effort uh, for all of Lincoln Center. How much money was necessary? It was. Uh, I mean, by today's standards, a paltry sum, but it was in, it was in you know, the Met itself, I, I, don't, I forget the exact figures, but it was something in the under $100 million, but, uh, but it, was a very, it was a huge amount of money at the time. And in fact, um, the other major players were, of course, Wallace Harrison. Uh, and the and architect. This, and this film is very much about architecture of the time. Uh, uh, and you know, Wallace Harrison and the other architects who were involved in building, designing the other buildings of Lincoln Center. And it's also important to, know, to note that uh, the Met's arrival at Lincoln Center uh, was somewhat a serendipitous affair. The Met had been looking, even before Bing, the Met had been looking for a new home for decades. There was that, one thought to putting it in a skyscraper at Rockefeller Center. They, it was originally, uh, Rockefeller Center was originally designed as Metropolitan Square with the Metropolitan Opera House, which was never built, to be the centerpiece of it. Uh, that was, those plans uh, were foiled by the Depression, the Great Depression. Uh, and, uh, but ultimately, it was a combination of the Met's need for a new home, the New York Philharmonic's need for a new home, uh, because they were, wanted to exit Carnegie Hall, and uh, Robert Moses' uh, unquenchable uh, uh, thirst for urban redevelopment and, and the raising of, the, uh, of a large part of the Upper West Side uh, that resulted um, in Lincoln Center and the Metropolitan Opera House being built. Let's talk about uh, some of the uh, architectural and technical features of uh, the new Opera House, particularly with regard to opening night. There, of course, the Everyone is familiar with the huge uh, Chagall murals which welcome you into the Opera House. Uh, but another feature are the teardrop chandeliers that uh, drop from the ceiling uh, as uh, the production is about to begin. The Sputniks. Uh, the Sputniks. Uh, and there's quite a story about that, isn't there? Uh, as, and uh, let's uh, uh, go to videotape and uh, hear a clip from the movie The Opera House as Kyra Liske, the daughter of, the, uh, of one of the architects, tells the story of the teardrop chandeliers. One day, my father very characteristically is making a sketch, mixed media, grabbing anything that's in front of him, and not only of conceiving of a design, but then quickly visualizing it. So he's drawing it in order to communicate to others for a meeting. And in the process of adding some finishing touches, with paint, a splat happened on his perspective, and there was no time to really start over again because it was just before meeting. All this paint splashed on the drawing and created some very nice elements, but in the middle of the drawing, like fireworks, you know. My Carson came and said, what did you do now? Rockefeller is waiting, Bim is waiting, everyone is waiting. Gosh, what shall we do now? When I brought this, look for a look, look and big all sorts of, well, it looks very nice. There's a reason why everybody went, ah. even though they had other intentions. My father's intention was not to splash across the page. Harrison's intention was to respect Rockefeller's intention, which was to do a traditional chandelier. But they all went, there's something that is shared that's just in the air. And suddenly it started to assert itself as not just an accident, but as something that could be the, the beginning, the birth, the genesis of the design. Well, accidents will happen, and sometimes it's for the best, and I guess that was the case with the, the chandeliers. Uh, but there was an accident as well with the turntable. You referred to it, and uh, the director of... Uh, 
Antony and Cleopatra was uh, the, another legend, uh, Franco Zeffirelli, uh, and he uh, was a man who became somewhat impatient if things didn't go right. Uh, so let's look at a clip that shows his reaction when the turntable on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House didn't work. The centerpiece of the new Met stage is a turntable around which Zeffirelli has designed his production. On it, he intends to change scenes, rotate huge props, and wheel armies into view, already drawn up for battle. So I'm standing in the auditorium, and he puts an army on the stage, and they don't march because the turntable breaks. I said, my God, what's this about? Let's see if you can start again now. It won't start. It won't work. You can get it going and get on it, and you see it works. There's no possible way of putting a cable under this. No, sir. So I go up in there, and somebody gets to look underneath the steel bent. I said, how in the world could that happen? So I run up to my office, and I see what it says. I call up the engineer. He said, Herman, we made a mistake. I said, what do you mean? I said to them, I told you clearly what I needed. I needed a turntable that could handle an automobile or an elephant standing on one foot. When we signed it, we went over all this. Just won't work. I'm just appalled. This is the first instance in the long life of the new Met that you have 200 people on a turntable that won't move. Throw it in the Hudson River. Take it and throw it. We can't use it. It's no use for anybody. Well, uh, that wasn't the only technical deficiency. There was a story about uh, a, a scene shift from the pyramids to the streets of Rome, and uh, poor Leontine Price in the tech rehearsal was trapped in the pyramid. Uh, remember that one? Of course. Uh, you know, Leontine uh, was uh, both... It, it's interesting in, in, the, in the film because Leontine reflects upon the story today, or a year ago when we interviewed her, and her memory was, was quite faultless. Uh, that was a, it was a traumatic moment in her, in her life because uh, she was very excited about singing and opening the new Met in the leading role in this opera, and at the dress rehearsal, uh, everything that could go wrong did go wrong, including her getting trapped inside of a pyramid that was supposed to uh, uh, auto automatically move off the stage, and uh, they had to uh, rescue her from, from that. And do you remember what she said when she was asked what was going through her mind at the time? I think she had some uh, concerns about whether she'd get out, ever get out of this place alive. But she said, honey, I had so much on my mind at that time, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> right. Uh, she's a character. And, and, and let's uh, uh, meet Leontine Price as she's uh, uh, portrayed in your film, The Opera House, uh, because uh, she has uh, quite a bit to say about uh, her uh, feelings on that opening night when she performed Antony and Cleopatra by Samuel Barber. Roll it. Because the whole point was for it to be an all-American occasion. That whole year, I dedicated myself to living almost like a nun. I did nothing that would possibly interfere with my being at my total, complete best. I was just so determined that I was going to do my country proud. Now, we had an American composer and an American singer and being selected for the opening night. You don't perform Antony and Cleopatra very much these days, do you? Well, sadly, that was its one and only performance at the Met, or rather that series of performances. Uh, it was not a great success. Uh, Barber was a wonderful composer, but that was not his greatest work. And uh, it was, uh, you know, in that sense, I guess an anticlimax. Everything else about it was wonderful. I mean, the event itself was, was remarkable. Um, it was uh, an opening night that was attended by dignitaries of, and, and cultural figures from all over the world. It was really considered, it was a, you know, resulting in a banner headline in the New York Times the next day. Uh, it was, it was a, one of the great, great uh, moments in, 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 in cultural history of the 20th century. And yet, the work was not 
a great success. Well, tell us a little bit about Leontine Price. Uh, you, uh, uh, she uh, didn't come from the streets of New York uh, to the Metropolitan Opera. Tell us something about her background and who she was. Well, you know, she was uh, from a small town, and in our film, we explore her 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 early uh, years um, growing up. Uh, she's very proud of her parents. In fact, her parents were at the opening night of, of uh, the new Met. She, um, her mother, she says in the film, uh, sings better than even she could, uh, just hang, while hanging laundry on the line outside in their yard, um, she would sing. And uh, that was really, I guess, what inspired Leontine to become an opera singer. And her, you know, her early, she went to Juilliard, uh, where, which is where she met Barber, in fact, uh, Samuel Barber, because, and Barber wrote uh, uh, some beautiful song cycles, including this, uh, uh, Knoxville's Summer of 1915, I think it's called, which uh, he chose her, even while she was still a student at Juilliard, to sing. Um, and that became one of uh, his signature works and one of her signature uh, works as well uh, to, uh, that she interpreted. And then she went on, you know, she, she like many singers, uh, before they come to the Met, she gained experience in Europe. And it was Bing who discovered her and Franco Corelli, who also plays a part in this film, who was the matinee idol tenor of the day. He discovered the two of them at the Arena de Verona uh, performing and, uh, according to her, immediately made an offer they couldn't refuse to come to the Met. And the first season she sang at the Met, which this is now going back to the 50s, late 50s, um, she sang, I think, seven different roles in one season. Because in those days, you know, the big opera stars would come to New York and spend the entire season at the Met. Uh, and so she became, over the course of that first season or two, a huge uh, national and international star because having a big career at the Met, of course, guaranteed her, her um, operatic stardom everywhere. And today, uh, uh, a star like Anna Netrebko comes in, does an opera, and then goes back to Europe somewhere. Well, today it's different because, you know, singers do, you know, uh, fly around the world. Uh, of course, with the Mets' uh, transmissions into movie theaters that we, you know, as you know, we transmit our Saturday matinees on occasion into movie theaters around the world, singers still want to be at the Met more probably than any other opera house because they know that we offer them kind of global distribution. So. Uh, uh, Anna, we're, we're, we're grateful to for wanting to be at the Met on, on average uh, two, two times a year, which for us is, 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 we would love to have her here seven times, but uh, getting Anna Nutrepko to sing twice, twice a season at the Met uh, is probably a bigger commitment than she gives to any other opera house. So, Did you ever hear Leontine Price sing? I heard Leontine Price sing several times. Uh, but uh, well, what was it like? In fact, in fact, I heard Leontine um, sing when I, w when I was a teenager, when I was 16 years old. I had my first part-time job. I was still in high school as an usher at the Met. And I was in charge of the standing room in the family circle, which is, you know, all the way at the very top of the... I mean, they wouldn't the give you the diamond horseshoe, for heaven's sake. No, I was, uh, <laughs> I was a kid. And, uh, um, but I had the privilege of hearing Leontine Price sing, sing Aida at the Met. Um, and it, in fact, it was hearing her and Corelli uh, and a few other stars like Renata Tibaldi that really kind of inspired me to want to pursue a career in the performing arts. I didn't know back then that I would end up being general manager of the Met, but I certainly, it certainly uh, made me think that, that working in the performing arts was the most kind of exciting and, and romantic profession one could pursue. Uh, when she made her debut at the Met, uh, Bing didn't want her to be in Verdi's Aida because he didn't want her introduced as a slave. He wanted her introduced uh, perhaps in Il Trovatore as uh, uh, another figure, but free. Uh, uh, do you remember that story? Did you ever discuss that with her? No, that's one story I never did discuss. But I, you know, I know though that she did something that you know few singers can do today, which is you know she really commanded all of the big dramatic. Uh, repertoire of, of Verdi and uh, you know she singers um, in her period were probably more versatile in terms of repertoire than singers are today um, with exceptions of course uh, but uh, you know Leontine no matter what role she took uh, it was something always special for the audiences and uh, in the film in fact at the beginning of the film we, we see her fair, a little bit of her farewell performance in Aida in 85 where she holds the, uh, a note in, in uh, the first act aria 
of Aida uh, for what seems like an impossible amount of time in the audience, although we don't show the audience's reaction for more than a few seconds. It actually, she had an ovation that went on for, for, I think, for 10 or 15 minutes in the middle of an opera, which is unheard of. I think Placido Domingo said she was the most beautiful Verdi soprano he had ever heard, and Maria Callas said, I hear a lot of love in your voice. And uh, that was, uh, that was Leontine Price. Now, I have a question for you, Peter Gelb. Uh, because we're coming to the end of this marvelous conversation. Uh, and was it uh, easier to uh, close the old Met with all the community protests about it, or uh, was it easier to open uh, the new Met? I think both were very difficult for, for Rudolf Bing, uh, who, who was at the, the point of leading, leading both the closing of the old Met and the opening of the new Met. Um, but I think that the excitement and adrenaline of opening a new theater of course, is uh, something that overcomes adversity. Uh, I think the Old Met, and there's a very touching moment in the film about the closing of the Old Met, the, the final gala, where, where, which was such an emotional outpouring for, for the performers as well as for the audience. Peter Gelb, thank you so much for coming by. Thanks this so much, Jim. Just marvelous. Great to see you. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.